All right, good morning. This is going to be your video notes for Wednesday, April 17th. So we're going to resume from where we were on the video notes on Tuesday while a lot of you are out for Rube Goldberg. And again, you're not going to have your uh, quiz today because um, I had a miss today and I don't want y'all to take it there without me. So we'll take it Friday. Um, so please be aware that you need to take it on on. I'm not fr Friday. I'm sorry, Thursday. So you need to take it on Thursday. Please be aware that if I am going to be at field day, so if you check in and come to field day, then you're going to get a zero for the quiz. So make sure that you are present and there for the quiz on Thursday during second hour. Here we go. So we left off in the middle of Yalta. We said that they at the Yalta conference in February of '45 they're going to agree on. Uh, a few things. We said France should take part in the administration of Germany after the war. Uh, Germany as a whole, and Berlin in particular, would be divided into four occupation zones by Britain, Soviets, U.S., and France, which we said all that yesterday in the video. The next, the new information, the third thing, is Eastern European countries liberated from Germany would be allowed to hold free elections, which well, that will be a bigger deal down the road. So Eastern European countries liberated from Germany would be allowed to hold free elections. Stalin also agreed that the Soviet Union would join the Allies in the war in the Pacific against Japan. So Stalin also agreed that the Soviet Union would join the Allies in the war against Japan by later that summer. He never gave a certain exact timetable. He just said later that year they would join, which is going to piss off a lot of the, the Allies because they're going to hate that he takes so long to come around to do it. All parties agree that Germany would be required to pay reparations. But the reparations would not be excessive. They didn't want a repeat of the Treaty of Versailles, so they're not trying to make the reparations that much in general. Um, and the civilian population would be allowed to rebuild their country as long as they accepted the terms of the Allied victory. So the civilian population would be allowed to rebuild their country as long as they accepted the terms of the Allied victory. So one more time, all parties agreed that Germany would be required to pay reparations, but the reparations would not be excessive. And the civilian population would be allowed to rebuild their country as long as they accepted the terms of the Allied victory. However, the Soviets did not fully honor the promise of the free elections to, in Eastern Europe. Surprise, surprise. Stalin wanted pro-Soviet governments in that region to serve as a buffer between the Soviet Union and Germany. Uh, the Soviets have now been invaded twice by Germany. They don't want this to happen again. And so essentially, after the Soviet troops invade those Eastern European countries at, towards the end of World War II... They're just not going to ever really leave. And essentially, the Soviets will establish military bases in the Eastern Europe, and they will become under Soviet influence. They won't become part of the Soviet Union, but they'll become directly under Soviet influence. Uh, even before the end of the war, it became clear to FDR and Churchill that Eastern Europe would become part of the Communist bloc, or the Eastern bloc as it's called. So essentially, those East, and I have a map of this in a second, but East, the Eastern European countries that were occupied by Soviet troops would become what's called the Eastern Bloc, also called the Satellite Nations, to serve as this buffer zone between any more Western invasions, especially from Germany. Nevertheless, Yalta, the Yalta Conference did foster a peaceful cooperation among the Allies in Western Europe and helped set the terms for the German surrender, even though there's going to be a lot of tension between the U.S. and the Soviets as uh, the war ends and wraps up. Of course, you have the later Potsdam Conference that summer, and just things um, remain kind of tense between the two countries. All right, finally, at the end of the Pacific War, which you don't have much to say about this one because most of this was fought between the U.S. and the Japanese, so you don't have much European involvement here, which is why there's not much to say for this class. But in July of 1945, the Allied powers met in Potsdam, Germany. Potsdam is spelled P-O-T-S-D-A-M, Germany to discuss outlining Japan's terms of surrender. The Allies and some Japanese leaders recognized that Japan uh, was almost defeated, uh, but during that conference in July, Truman, the new president who replaced FDR once he died, uh, was told that the atomic bombs were ready to go, so they gave Japan an ultimatum to surrender. Um, Japan did not, and so uh, in early August, the United States decided to drop atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, forcing Japan to finally formally surrender. So they'll formally surrender on September 2nd, which is referred to as VJ Day. So both both sides of the war are done by September of 1945 officially. And just kind of wrap up, and these are numbers just to kind of give you, but you don't have to know long-term or anything. But um, in World War, World War I, you had military deaths about 10 million. 
In World War II, you had about 23 million uh, military deaths. Uh, you had about 22 million injured in World War One. You have 25 million injured in World War II. Nine million civilian deaths in World War One. Here's the big kicker. Here's the big jump. About 49 million World War II civilian deaths. A lot of that coming from places like China or the Soviet Union and those areas. So that's the end of World War II. You can see here kind of how Europe looks after. Uh, you're going to see that we talked about this. Uh, Germany is divided into four occupation zones. More on that in a minute. And you can see how Eastern Europe is going to fall under Soviet control or Soviet influence. So all this area here is Soviet territory. But Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, East Germany, they will become what's called the satellite nations or Eastern Bloc under direct, pretty much direct influence of the Soviets, just not part of their actual country. And everything else in the green color is considered to be essentially the West or um, more democratic, more liberalism type governments in general. Okay, so now we're switching gears to the Cold War. And the way that the, the book I have and where we're going to do the Cold Wars is kind of broken up. We're not going to go all exactly chronological. It's going to be more thematic, so we might kind of move through the Cold War and come back and move through it a different way. But most of y'all remember a lot of this, or some of these concepts from last year, so it shouldn't be totally new to you. Okay, the Cold War in Europe and in the world. So during World War II, Western democracies in Europe and the United States allied with the Communist Soviet Union in an effort to defeat Nazism. So during World War II, Western democracies in Europe and the United States allied with the Communist Soviet Union in an effort to defeat Nazism. Political differences between liberal democracy and communism were put aside to focus on the Allies' goal of defeating the Axis. So basically, communism and, and liberal democracies put aside their differences to fight together during World War II, which we talked talk, talk about this before. It's enemy, my enemy is my friend. As the defeat of Germany became certain in 1945, Allied leaders began to talk about the peace process, and those and these differences once again became prominent. So during the war, they got along, but when the war was ending, a lot of the tension returned between the democracies and the communist country. Um, the United States and the Soviet Union emerged from the war as two political and military superpowers. And that's a phrase you can only use during the Cold War, so please don't use the term superpower for any part of American or European history. Uh, it has to apply only to these two countries post-World War II. Uh, but basically you have them emerge as two uh, big-time industrial military powers, massive militaries, massive industrialization. Even though Soviets had a lot of damage, and fought in the war and lost a lot of lives. In fact, they lost like 22 million people. Um, they still emerged as a superpower, even though America lost far fewer people. Um, but they both have very different visions for the post-war Europe. So as we know, America is going to be democratic and, the, and capitalist. Both, both systems are very much people-led. People vote in democracies, pick their leaders, capitalism. It's all people-led decisions in the economy in terms of what's bought and what's sold, whereas the Soviets are going to be led by a totalitarian dictatorship with Joseph Stalin and throughout its entire reign by other dictators too. But also it's a communist system, in this case a state-controlled system. So very different outlooks and ideas about what should happen in the world. Okay, so neither side was willing to engage in another massive battle on the ground. They didn't want another world war, especially once nuclear bombs come along. So instead, tensions led to a Cold War in which conflicts played out in propaganda campaigns, secret operations, limited military conflicts, and an arms race. So instead, tensions led to a Cold War, meaning that they never fought each other directly and never went hot, which conflicts played out in propaganda campaigns, secret operations, limited military conflicts, and an arms race. The Cold War would last nearly 50 years. It lasts until about 1991 when the Soviet Union finally collapses. So that is kind of the start, the foundation of the Cold War in general. Okay, the division of Europe. The division of Europe. So U.S. President FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill had helped establish the United Nations right towards the end of the war. So the United Nations is going to replace the old... You remember from before, after World War I, the old League of Nations that had developed from Wilson and those guys back in the 19-teens. And it's going to be – the UN will be established here in 1945. Um, they hoped that this new international organization would be more effective than the League of Nations that had been in mediating disputes among nations before. 
um, because it just never got anything done. In this time, the United States decides, decides to be part of it, which is going to be a big factor. So will the Soviets and so forth. Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union negotiated with the other Allied leaders on certain aspects of the UN makeup. So Stalin of the Soviet Union negotiated with other Allied leaders on certain aspects of the United Nations makeup. In the end, concessions were made and the basis for the UN Charter was laid. So in the end, concessions were made. Both sides had to give up some concessions, and the UN Charter was completed by June of 1945, uh, which they completed in San Francisco. And the United Nations headquarters this day is located in New York City. Um, so divisions between the West and the East were soon reflected, however, in the workings of the United Nations, as the U.S. and Soviets each had veto powers in the Security Council. So uh, Security Council exists in the United Nations. It still exists today. And there are five permanent members of the Security Council in the United Nations, basically the five major allies of World War II, U.S., Soviets, China, Britain, and France. And so they're always members of the Security Council as they are today, and any member of the Security Council can veto any other measure proposed by any country. So 14 members of the Security Council, because there's 10 other countries involved in the Security Council, they can all vote yes, and one country, say the Soviets, might say no, and they can't do it then. So the Security Council and the United Nations in general were a great place for the U.S. and the Soviets to have a lot of influence over other countries, especially in trying to make changes in general and trying to basically promote their ideas worldwide. Um, and they would, and so these two countries would not approve decisions that conflicted with their interests. Several specific issues soon led to division of Europe. So we're going to go through that again real quick, but we're going to go ahead and stop this video and do the rest of the next video.